Somebody was asking, uh, we have one more essay. They put it in the chat box. Yes, yeah, you're gonna have one more essay and it's it's gonna be sort of a, I don't wanna call it comprehensive, but it'll it'll be pretty, you know, the topics will be broad. And so, um, you know, we're gonna finish SART, move on to Nietzsche, do as much Nietzsche as we can. I don't know how far we're gonna get on Beyond Good and Evil. And then, yeah, you're gonna have one final uh, uh, grade. Somebody else had a question they're about to jump in? Uh, well, I, this can be, I do have a question, but I just realized it could be saved after class. Oh, okay. If, yeah, it's more like personal pertaining to yourself than maybe, you know. Yeah, but it, it's a personal yeah. one, so yeah, I don't, All right, yeah. Cool. I'll save right. for later. Anybody else got anything? No? Okay, well, let me, uh, let's get back to the uh, PowerPoint that I was, you know, I guess I was sort of writing this as, as we were going along last time. Uh, actually, this is some new stuff that I have. Uh, let me back up. So this is the slide where we left off. I was talking about, so the, the essay that we're reading uh, is really a transcript, right? Existentialism is a humanism. It's a transcript of a talk, a speech, whatever you want to call it, a presentation uh, he gave in which he was responding to his critics. And they were more or less focusing on his his major philosophical work at the time which was being and nothingness and so we talked a little bit about this last class but we really got interrupted uh because of my technical problems uh right when we were kind of getting into it you know uh i i, I told you last time this is probably as far as we got uh that being and nothingness was not a work of existentialism when it first came out this term existentialism this is a label that sartre eventually accepted but he did not coin the phrase or the term himself uh it was a label um that was given to his philosophy and other similar philosophies that were coming out in france and germany during this time um uh, and he ironically is one of the only people to accept the title so when he says in the essay that he's an existentialist and he lists all these other philosophers, you know, he says, oh, there's some uh, Christian existentialist, there's German, uh, the German atheistic existentialist and some, you know, atheistic French existentialist. Um, everybody on that list, pretty much, I would say, I think all of them, they did not like the title and they wouldn't accept the title existential. And as a matter of fact, Heidegger uh, wrote a letter on humanism uh, a few years after this came out and distancing himself from Sartre and the existentialist movement. No, nonetheless, here we are. We've got this earlier essay, Being in Nothing, as we talked about this last class. This is what Sartre's critics are taking him to task for. And this is what he's responding to in the essay. And he himself does not seemed to be, or he wasn't, he's not around anymore to be this way, but he was not satisfied uh, with this essay. He was not satisfied with his speech. And ironically, it's the most widely read, widely studied of anything he ever wrote. Uh, although you know, his other works get a lot of attention too, but this one probably gets the most, you're gonna read it in, in, in any intro class, to, not any, but a lot of intro classes to philosophy. So it gets a lot of traction and he, he kind of disowned it almost immediately after he gives the speech. He's like, oh man, I was, but I think that in a way that's okay. Um, it's kind of sucks for him because he could have done better defending his position, but I think it's okay because this is a pretty, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Um, Compared to other works of philosophy, it's fairly straightforward. It's 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 an easy reading, uh, you know, relatively, you know, for philosophy, it's fairly straightforward, uh, and you kind of get his basic point. You get the philosophy of existentialism. You understand, you know, he defines his doctrine. So in that sense, it's not a horrible essay. It's some of the claims he makes in the essay are very uh, bold, and they need a little bit of elaboration. And he doesn't, I think, quite elaborate on some of the points he makes and some of the language in it, since it's so bold, uh, you know, he, he makes these bold assertions, like for instance, that, that, that if I'm free and I want my freedom, uh, I should want everybody else to be free. I want as much freedom for everybody else as possible. And it's not quite clear why that's the case. And he doesn't seem to explain it, at least I would say very well in this essay. And so not, not today, but probably next week, um, or, or next class, maybe Thursday, uh, depending on how long it takes us to get through this. But I will probably be drawing on other sources to help Sartre out. There's another essay 
uh, from Simone de Beauvoir, who was a friend of his. They were lifelong lovers and friends and uh, philosoph philosophical cohorts. And she wrote an essay right after this one, you know, about a year or so later and, and published it in, in, you know, this journal that both Sartre and, and his friend Marlou Ponty run, uh, ran. And uh, she does a better job, I think, of kind of expanding a bit on what he says here and providing a bit more context for some of these claims like why should i care about other people's freedom why why should i give a toss about anybody else's freedom in fact it seems like if you read sartre's earlier work being in nothingness you would actually want to uh you wouldn't care about other people's freedom there's no basis to care for other people's freedom this is one of the criticisms of sartre is that uh it's just this sort of uh a subjective uh, value system where nothing really matters unless I decide that it matters. And so, and he even asserts that the only thing that stops me from anything I want is, well, just the brute facts of life. I can't, you know, swim underwater for longer than I need to breathe. And I can't fly like Superman. I can't walk through walls. There are limits to my freedom. But beside that, besides that, there really aren't any limits to me besides what other people impose on me. And so for Sartre, you know, if that's true, it seems like if other people can impose things on me and prevent me from doing things, why would I want them to be free? Well, maybe I'd want them to be my servant, my slave, and I'd be the master. Um, and Sartre doesn't want to say that. He wants to say that I need to recognize all people's freedom. And he, he doesn't give us really much uh, of an argument for this, at least that I can see very well here in this essay. So. We, like I said, we probably won't get that far today in the essay. We're probably just going to spend most of the time just kind of laying down the groundwork. What is his philosophy? What is existentialism? And then we'll get to the more critical part uh, probably next class or maybe even next week, depending on, you know, how long this is going to take. Uh, but just a quick recap from last time, just to get us back on where we left off. His earlier work, Being in Nothingness, again, he's not seeing himself as an existentialist when he writes it. He actually sees himself as a phenomenologist. And he never uses the word phenomenology. He never uses the word ontology in our essay. Uh, but I, need, I think we should introduce ourselves to these terms because I think it's important to understand part of his argument and where he's coming from. Because when, he's, when we talk about phenomenology, we're talking about trying to understand things from the point of view of the person experiencing those things. So if I'm trying to do a phenomenology on uh, shame or a phenomenology on uh, pride, like these are emotions that we all feel. And a phenomenologist will try to understand, well, what is it like to feel shame from the inside? Are there certain elements in that experience that are true, regardless of I'm shamed or you're shamed? Uh, what is it like for anybody to feel shame? I use that as an example because that's something you know, that was a particular um, emotion that Sartre liked to talk a lot about was this feeling of shame. And so you, you might say like a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a, or a neuroscientist, they might try to study shame from the outside. So as an observer, I'm looking at somebody else who feels it and I'm looking at the symptoms. And I'm trying to you know, describe the symptoms and maybe the causes behind those symptoms, maybe a chemical imbalance or, you know, the neurons firing in the brain. This part of the brain is, is what makes you feel shameful or something like this. Those are all scientific, uh, you know, what, what, what Husserl, you know, Husserl was a phenomenologist. He called these the third person account, uh, the third person, but the phenomenological account is the first person. What is it like to feel shame? What is it like to feel emotions? And, and Sartre, he's doing a phenomenology uh, on many things, but the general phenomenology is on being. What is, when I say that something is, uh, when I say that this bottle of water is, or that I am, or that my students are, what, is, what does that mean? What is, what is being? What is that phenomenon? What, what is the, the similarity between all these cases of things being? And so, you know, as I, as I, I think I've repeated myself three times now, he's not seeing himself as an existentialist here. He's seeing himself as a phenomenologist doing ontology. And so his ontology, his theory of being, is basically dualistic, at least his earlier stuff. You know, and that's all we need to worry about now for this essay. You know, his, he later develops a sort of more complicated ontology in his later philosophy, but 
that's for a that's a totally other topic. You know, we can we can sort of ignore that. But just to keep it simple, right? His early philosophy, you've got two types of beings. You've got being that's for itself, that's the kind of being that we are, and being in itself. And when we speak of being in general, when we say that things are, for Sartre, uh, what that always involves, what that always involves, whether we're talking about being for itself or being in itself, it always involves some form of negation. What does he mean by negation? Well, what he means is that for me to see this being as being a thing, this bottle as being a bottle, I'm negating everything besides the bottle, okay? So it's not the table that it's sitting on. It's not the coaster that it's sitting on top of. It's not me. It's not the room. It's its own thing, and it's separate from other things. So the, the primary way that I encounter beings is as not other beings, Right, as negated from other beings. And for Sartre, when I do this, when, you know, he says, I'm the kind of being where, um, um, you know, I do this all the time. I, I notice things. I notice, you know, something steps, uh, uh, jumps out at me, perhaps. Uh, I'm trying to uh, explain something about Sartre to you. And I'm trying to think of an example, and I jump to the bottle. You know, the bottle jumps out at me. I could have grabbed the binoculars instead but the bottle was, you know, jumped out at me, okay? But when Sartre says, when I do that, I'm not just like a computer. I'm not, this is not just some sort of logical calculation that my brain is hardwired to just automate, automatically do. When I, when I feel, I feel is probably the wrong word, but when, when, I, when I inhabit, perhaps, a world with meaning, which I always do, you know, whether I'm even aware of it or not, everything is sort of significant or has some sort of meaning for me. Um, you know, right now, if you're really paying attention to the lecture, you might be lost in the lecture. You might be just trying to understand and follow what I'm saying. Uh, and you, you have an awareness that you're trying to do that. You're not telling yourself the whole time, I'm sitting here listening to a lecture on SART. Professor Ross is trying to explain SART. But you know that that's happening. You know that that's happening. There's a sort of tacit or, or sort of, uh, what's, the, what's the word that Dreyfus always uses? A, a sort of transparent um, um, knowledge or knowing. You know that you're sitting in a chair if you're sitting in a chair, but you're not thinking about sitting in a chair. So there's a sort of direct awareness. Um, but again, when we do this, it's not just a sort of calculation like a logical computer, like some ones and zeros. Uh, I think last class, this is where I started getting cut off. I was using the, uh, the analogy of the Terminator. I'm assuming most of you, if not everyone, has seen at least one of the Terminator movies. And I've only seen the first two, so I don't know anything past that. But I'm assuming they do this in all of the movies. You, every once in a while, you'll see the world from the, from the point of view of the Terminator robot. So you've got these killer robots from the future, and, you know, they're here to kill. And um, you sometimes see the world through their eyes, and it's always they walk into a room, and, and they sort of take stock of everything. They make an inventory list, right? Uh, tall man in the corner, approximately 200 pounds, six feet, whatever, you know, and, and you know, they're, you know, this sort of thing. That's not us, says Sartre, right? We're not these sort of computers that walk around. Yes, it is a sort of negation. It's a sort of a calculation when we, when we isolate things and notice them. But when we do that, he says, it, we're, we're, we're um, there's some normative content involved, okay? Um, we're, we're expressing, or expressing is probably not even a good word, we're embodying or acting out a norm. So why would he say that? You know, he says that, again, when I notice, when I recognize the glass is a glass, when I recognize the binoculars are binoculars, when I recognize the bottle is a bottle, that has normative content. It expresses or embodies a norm. What do you think he means by that? How does that express a norm when I call this a bottle? I guess I could, you know, I mean, I call this thing a desk that I'm sitting at, you know, where I have all my books and my, my laptop. Why do I call it a desk? I could call it anything I wanted to. Sartre admits that. I could call it, I could, you know, I'm going to start, these are zebras. I'm going to call this a zebra. Why don't I do that? I could. You were about to say something, I thought. Kenneth, did you take your microphone? <laughs> but what does he mean by normative? So I, I'm saying, so, again, 
you know, I, I'm calling this a bottle. Why don't I call it a, you know, a seesaw? Or call this a book. I'm going to call this a book. Everything that looks like this, I'm going to call it a book from now on. And everything that looks like this, I'm going to call it a bottle from now on. Because I just feel like it. I could do that. Why, why wouldn't I? Why would I not want to do that? What would happen? Uh, what would happen to me? What if, if I start like every desk I call a zebra? I'm like, hey man, I got this badass zebra. I did homework on it last night. It was like really nice. Fit all my homework. Well, it goes against the norm. Yeah, it's it, no one would understand what the hell you're talking about. You know, like what the hell? So if you want to be eccentric or some weirdo, you, you can invent language or whatever. You can you start doing this, but um, but you don't, and most of us don't, and we don't even reflect on it. We don't even reflect on it. We're just yeah, bottle, desk, chair, table, whatever. Uh, we just take it for granted. Uh, whatever language we learned, you know, that's that's what we refer to that object as. So it's a norm. I'm I'm adhering to a standard. I'm adhering to a, a norm. I inhabit a world of significance uh, that's full of objects that I adhere to. Right? Yeah, these are doors. You walk through them and things like this. And I'm not really I'm not even consciously thinking about this, but yet my actions reveal this. You know, that, I, that I'm adhering to these rules. You know, I'm, I'm almost tempted to use Wittgenstein's uh, uh, notion of a language game. You know, I'm playing this game. I, there's rules to it. I've decided to more or less follow those rules. Um, so just seeing a being as a type of a being, just seeing this as a bottle, seeing a chair as a chair, it, that actually has normative value. That's we're expressing a norm. It's not just a given brute fact. And I keep talking about freedom, this is the big difference between the two types of being, okay? You have being in itself on the one hand. This is what Sartre says just is, just is what it is, right? These are the objects, the beings in themselves. These are the objects of my experience. But the being for itself, this is the kind of being that I am. This is the kind of being that you are. And when we try to isolate that being, the kind of being that I am, the kind of being that you are, we're really left with this emptiness, with this nothingness. That's why the title of the book, Being and Nothingness. Um, as, as Sartre puts it, we are, we are the negation at the heart of being. We are the nothingness at the heart of being. Um, if we try to distinguish ourselves from our surroundings, okay? So I'm not this bottle. I'm not the desk. I'm not the computer. I'm not, you know, I'm not my students that are listening or maybe not listening or whatever. Um, I'm not, 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 not all these things. This is the self known through negation and it's a pretty empty self. It's just consciousness, bare, empty consciousness. And for start, it's always free. It's always free to interpret or to associate itself with anything it likes. Like this is the radical freedom of the for itself, as start puts it. Um, and so the objects out there, for him, Sartre's going to argue, the objects don't have any significance or any meaning in themselves. The desk, the tables, the chairs, the mountain, the bridge, anything that we take as significant and meaningful is only meaningful in the context of what Sartre calls a project. So all of us, all beings for themselves, all, you know, we're for itself. All of us are involved in a project. And I'm not talking about, you know, some group project from like your science class or something like this. Um, but a, like a life project, I guess you could say. For, for Sartre, we engage in the world. We're given all these possibilities, all these choices. And the choices we make uh, inevitably are based on the project that we're engaged in. So, you know, you might argue that, um, I mean, this pen right here is just a pen. It doesn't matter what kind of life project I'm engaged in. Like if, if my life goal is to be a businessman or my life goal is to be a teacher or my life goal is to be a father or a family man or whatever, right? Um, this is still a pen, right? A pen is a freaking pen. What are you talking about? But Sartre's going to say, yeah, sure, there's something to that. But on the other hand, the value of the pen, the actual value of the pen, the, the significance of the pen is going to be unique to different people. 
For instance, this particular pen is red. For some people, this is a useless pen. I don't want a red pen. I need a black or a blue pen to take notes. Red pens aren't the best, but since I'm a professor, and sometimes when I'm not teaching Zoom and online 24 seven, I used to actually have students print out papers and, or we would do tests or grades and I'd grade with the red pen. So for me, this pen is more valuable I, perhaps to somebody who is in the legal profession, who needs a legal, uh, a blue or, or, or a, a black pen. Um, I'm looking right now, I don't see any, but I, you know, like a dry erase marker, you know, a dry erase marker, is really expensive, by the way. If you don't know that those Expo markers that we use on the dry erase board at school, um, they're real expensive. And, you know, as a student, you might appreciate a good one if it's got really dark ink so that you can see what the teacher, the professor is writing on the board. It's very clear, but the professor probably values it even more because they know how expensive they are. And the professor knows like how sometimes you buy a pack of these stupid markers and like half of them are dry and they don't even work. So you wasted all this money. So there's an infinite amount of ways, Sartre is gonna to say, to interpret a marker, just a marker. You know, let's imagine I'm the, uh, the custodian who has to like clean the, the dry erase board every week at the end of the week. For me, the marker is a mess maker, you know? Uh, for the professor, it's a tool. You know, for, so, so for Sartre, the, the in itself, the objects of consciousness, the, the objects for the for itself, uh, don't have any set meaning. The mountain doesn't have a set meaning. You know, if I'm if I'm on vacation in in Switzerland in, in, and I'm just hiking through the Swiss Alps and I'm just there to enjoy the view, the mountains appear to me as beautiful, something to be photographed, something to be appreciated for aesthetically, something to enjoy the, the, the beauty of. Okay. But if I'm a mountain climber, now the mountain takes on a new meaning. I want to climb it, or maybe I don't, because it's too it's not much of a challenge if I'm an advanced climber, I might say, well, it's pretty, but I, I've done things twice that height. That's not really enough for me to get a crew together and gear and all that stuff. Or maybe it's too big. I'm like, oh, geez, I'm going to have to practice on that one first. Um, if the mountain is in my way and I've got to get on the other side of the mountain, now it's an obstacle. So you see that the possibilities are endless, uh, but the possibilities are in the individual, in the for itself, in the person who's engaging with that environment. And this for itself which we are, has this radical freedom, has this absolute ability to interpret the world as they see fit, to engage in any project that they would like to. If they want to become a doctor, they become a doctor, uh, or try to at least, right? It's no guarantee that they're going to succeed, but they can always try, right? They can always uh, try for something. This is the radical freedom of the for itself. Again, there are only two limits, Sartre says, um, to our freedom. One of them um, I've already mentioned, uh, and so we'll, we'll get to that second. I'll uh, see how, if y'all are paying attention. The first one I haven't mentioned yet. Well, I think I actually did mention this, but I didn't use this word. Uh, the first limit uh, to freedom of the for itself uh, is what Sartre calls facticity. And so this is, you know, this is a jargon here, facticity. He's get, actually getting the word from Heidegger. I've mentioned Heidegger before, who's a big influence on Sartre. And he means the same thing as Heidegger. For, for Heidegger, for Sartre, facticity is just the brute facts. You can't, you're not free to just decide to be born five years earlier. You're not free to decide to be born in a different city or to have different parents or to grow up to be eight feet tall. You can't just decide. Those are just things you can't change. Those are the facts. You can't change the fact that you can't breathe underwater without assistance, you know, without scuba gear. You know, you can't change these things. Those are just brute facts. So those are things that are limits to your freedom. What, what else gets in the way of your freedom? I mentioned this earlier. What else can prevent you from just doing whatever the heck you want? Uh, the norms. Close. Where do the norms come from? Society. Okay, and what is society made up of? Like, hey, what the rule? What's that? Uh, the rules and it, the people who made them. There you go. The people. The people who made them. 
Right. Yeah. So, so other, as Sartre puts it, other freedoms. So another person can get in the way of your possibilities. You know, let's say you're up for a promotion at work and you're really pretty sure you're going to get it. You've been there longer than anybody else has. You're qualified for the position. Your boss likes you. Your boss pretty much has hinted that you're going to get the promotion. So you're like, hey, man, pretty awesome. I'm going to get this. And some dude from Harvard or Yale applies for your job like a week later who's like way overqualified or something and like really needs the job or something like that. I don't know. So all of a sudden, this other freedom has cut off your possibility, not to mention even a more nefarious example, which we'll, we'll have to get to later on. I don't know if we're going to get this far today, but other people can oppress you, right? They have political power. You know, they can, you know, oppress you. They, you know, segregate you, arrest you, throw you in jail, you know, all that sort of thing. And that prevents you uh, from doing you know, engaging in whatever project uh, you'd like to engage in. And, but there's also a more subtle way in which the other person limits you. And this is something that I think Sartre does, he does a disservice to himself by not mentioning this in our essay, the one that we're covering. He talks about this phenomenon he calls the look. And so this is always tied to our interactions with other people. Uh, and so I might as well just put the look of the other. The other here is always capitalized in this context because he's talking about when he says the look, what is looking at us is not just a thing. You know, this, this is an other. The bottle is not me. It's other than me. Okay. Even my body is other than me, Sartre says. Someone say, nah, you're tied to your body. You are your body. Your body is, you identify with your body. But Sartre's like, no, I mean, I have a body, but the for itself is the consciousness of having a body or something like this, right? But, uh, but let's skip all that. Uh, the other, capital O, it's not just some object out there. It's another for itself, or at least that's how I see it. I'm like, this is a person staring at me and judging me, you know? So, um, we often, we get in these situations where we're presented with, I don't know if a dil dilemma is the right way to put it. We're, we're, we're put into a, a tense scenario where we want to do, do the right thing. We're not quite sure what the right thing is. And maybe there's various people in our lives who are going to have different opinions about our actions, right? So if we do A, two or three of our friends are going to say that's right. And then two or three of our friends are going to say that's horrible. But if we do B, then vice versa. Okay. So there's always going to be this tension. We're always going to be thinking about, geez, how, what's mom going to think? What's my girlfriend going to think? What's my buddy so-and-so going to think? What's uncle Fred going to think? Right. This is sort of thing. And, and, uh, and, and this is always going to be there on some level. The look of the other, you're always going to feel this for Sartre. This is, it, the way he handles it, honestly, it sounds very negative, um, but it's a good thing. It's actually good that we have this, you know, it, it, people will often criticize Sartre as, oh, he sounds like a paranoiac. Like he sounds like some paranoid dude who's always like self-conscious of what people are thinking about him. Um, I think his language is so dramatic that, that he comes off that way. But no, this is very subtle. You know, this is a very subtle thing. It's, it's, you don't have to be super hyper self-conscious to know what he's talking about here. Everybody feels the look of the other at some point of time. Uh, we might be in self-denial about this. I remember I was on a date with the, uh, um, this woman once. She, and we got, I don't know, I guess we call it an argument. <laughs> Didn't go well. But she said something to the effect that uh, she says, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. And I said, yeah, you do. You care what some people think about you. I was like, maybe you, maybe you don't care about their approval, but you care what they think. And man, she got mad. She said, no, I don't, I don't care what they think. No, no, no. You know, she got real defensive, which to me proved my point. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, you're proving my point right now. You're getting real angry that I don't agree with you. Why do you care? I thought you didn't care what people think about you. You seem to care that I don't think that you think that, you know, anyway, she got really pissed. 
but you, even me when I was a stupid little rebel Kurt Cobain wannabe in high school I, I thought I said the same kind of stuff I don't care what people think about me I'm a rebel screw society yeah screw the rules you know that was me in high school right I guess there's still a little still a little bit of, of that in me left I guess but um you know I was this long haired Kurt Cobain wannabe but I still cared I cared what people thought about me I wanted them to think I was a rebel you know I wanted them to think I was you know not it couldn't conform and you know i wouldn't be see uh, back then I mean, even today i'm not a big fan of polo shirt sorry if you're wearing a polo shirt but like like i would not be seen dead in a polo t-shirt or like tommy hill figure some designer stuff but that's preppy man that's sell out that's you know commercial you know, i had an image of myself that i wanted to present to the world okay and, and start says this is always going to happen and in fact it's it's good though because if it weren't for the other, if, it, if there were no other freedoms, he implies, and I'm, I think I'm kind of with him on this. I think he's got a good argument for this. We'll, we'll talk about his argument, you know, later on. Uh, but he says, but without the other, if, if there be no sense of self, right, our sense of identity, anything positive we think about ourselves, not positive in the sense of good, but positive in the sense of just having content. You know, like, even if you see yourself as a bad person, you can't see yourself as bad uh, unless there are other people who would consider you bad. At least this is, this is Sartre's argument. It's not quite clear on the face of it how that works, but, but um, I think he's right. And I'm going to, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll give you his argument for it in a minute. But just before we get into the reading, though, um, I think that this notion of the look is helpful because, especially at the outset of the reading, he said something like, uh, my good is the good for all. So when I say that this is the right way to do things, that this is the, you know, when I make a value judgment, I'm not just making it for myself. I'm sort of putting forth this value judgment as if everybody else should agree with me. And I think his wording here is sloppy or the translators never get it right because every translation I've seen says it this way. But I think that this is easily misunderstood. When he says the good, my good is the good for all, He's not implying that, you know, if I decide, like, let me say, like, and this is definitely not true, but like, if I say, this is the best book ever written, you know, I think that Sartre's existentialism is a humanism is the greatest essay that was ever written in the history of essays. Um, let's say I actually believe that, which I don't, <laughs> but let's say I believe that. Even if I believe that it was the best essay uh, that was ever written, do I necessarily assume that everyone should agree with me about that? You know, like if I like chocolate ice cream, that's my favorite flavor. Do I necessarily, my good is the good for all? Oh, if you don't think chocolate's the best, you're a fool. No, we know that other people have different tastes. So what does he mean by saying that my good is the good for all? It ties into, I think, the look of the other. Because what he's talking about is when I say that, that I'm going to be a certain way and I act that way and I pursue certain goals... It's not that I'm saying other people should also pursue those goals, but I'm, all, I'm basically holding myself, if I'm, I gotta be honest about myself, I'm holding myself to account uh, and I have to be aware of how the other is going to see me. So again, if I decide that Sartre's essay, this existentialism is humanism is the greatest essay ever written, that's fine. Uh, but if I really wanna like, live by that conviction, I'm going to have to bump into people who don't agree with me and are going to say, you really think that? I, there's all these holes in this essay. You could find all these problems with it. Sartre wrote better stuff. You should read his other this or that, you know, something like that. I have to defend myself before the other. And so in a sense, maybe Sartre should have said instead of my good is the good for all, it's like my good is the good before all, before the other. But this look of the other, again, it's something that, that, that f uh, forces me to reflect on myself. Most of the time, he says, when we're sort of just going about our day, doing what we do, we're not really thinking or reflecting on what we're doing. As I was saying earlier, you're not thinking about sitting in a chair when you're sitting in a chair, except for maybe now that I pointed it out to you. But you know, you're normally just sort of on autopilot. Uh, as Sartre puts it, you are your actions. You are your activities. There's no separation between you and your doings. It's not until you feel the look of the other that you start to reflect on what you're doing and why you're doing it, how you look to someone else. 
you know, Sartre gives, he likes to give all these really salty examples. I think, you know, one of the examples he gives, I think the first one he gives of this is, is uh, the peeping Tom example. Um, uh, anybody, uh, y'all know what a peeping Tom is, I hope. Anybody not know what it is? You need me to explain a peeping Tom? You know, kind of this pervert, you know, just checking out people through the window. You know, starts talking about how, look, the guy, when he's doing the deed, when he's, you know, the guy's like, like leaning over, looking through the keyhole, trying to see the person on the other side. Um, and you got to imagine like an old school door with one of those huge skeleton keys of the keyhole you can see through. Uh, he's looking through that and, and he's not even thinking about himself. He's just like, oh, like, just trying to figure out how to get a good look, you know. But the moment that he hears footsteps, someone's walking down the hall, they might catch me. Then he's forced to reflect. He's, you know, a rustling in the bushes behind him. Oh crap, somebody watching me? You know, so this is, you know, immediately he shudders. You know, there's this immediate realization that he might get caught. And so the look, there doesn't even have to really be someone there, you know, and you can still feel the look of the other. Um, you know, there's an example of the, the professor from, uh, from uh, you know, so the peeping Tom, you know, he feels shame before the other, I guess, you know, that's, and shame for Sartre only makes sense because of this, because we're, we're imagining how we might look to the other person. And um, he also talks about this, this, this other example from one of his, 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 his fictional books, uh, the, A the Age of Reason. The Age of Reason is, you know, like I said, it's, it's a work of fiction. But, oh, sorry, I've got, a, I, I've got like three or four people in the waiting room. So I've got to pause here for a second to, to let them in. Okay, looks like I got them. Okay, cool. So in the Age of Reason, I'll just give you one more example and then we'll move on to the actual reading. Um, there's the main character, he's a professor, and the first chapter he goes to visit his, his girlfriend, his mistress, and he finds out she's pregnant. And he immediately is like, well, I'm going to take care of this. Don't you worry. Um, my friend had to deal with this three, three months ago. He had to pay a lot of money, but he, I think he knows a Swiss doctor who can take care of this. So he's assuming they want to get rid of the baby. And this is like 1940s or late 30s. It's between World War I and World War II, early 40s, I guess. And it's in Paris. And so it's like abortion's not legal. And he's assuming that they, he's got to go find some, you know, some doctor and he leaves. And so he walks off to go take care of all this. And when Sartre is writing this story, he, you know, he makes it clear that the, the woman stays behind and the main character, he goes off into the streets of Paris to, to go figure this out. But he talks about her staring at him, you know, even though she's not there, her face is right there. She's looking at him, staring him in the face. And he keeps thinking about, geez, she must be so angry with me. And, and she should be. I'm such a fool. You know, it's totally my fault. I should have been more careful. I should have been more careful about these things. You know, so he's, he's, he's thinking about the way she's thinking about him. You know, and, and, he's, and he starts thinking, maybe she wants to have the baby. I just assumed she wanted to get rid of it. Maybe we should get married. I'm such a fool. I'm so insensitive, you know. And, and then eventually he, 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 he loses, you know, he gets distracted. And, she, you know, the look goes away. She's no longer there. You know, he goes to the cafe and he gets a cappuccino or whatever. Uh, but then he sees the woman walking down the street with a baby carriage. And all of a sudden, ah, oh, she's back, right? She's looking at me. And so this is something we carry with us, you know, wherever we go. And we typically don't want to be responsible for our actions. This is key. And this is actually a pretty good segue into the reading because this is one of the main points I think Sartre is trying to drive home is that we need to take responsibility for our choices. Uh, as he says, you know, we are a being for itself. We're not just an in itself, but we often try to treat ourselves as such. We deny our freedom. We, we, we hide from our freedom. Um, we try to see ourselves as a thing, not a free project, not a free open project. Um, we try to see ourselves, he says that we, this is kind of confusing, he says, we want to be an inkwell the way that an inkwell is an inkwell. But no one knows what a freaking inkwell is anymore, so maybe that's not the best example, but um, maybe you do. Maybe you've seen like, an, like a movie, like an old-timey movie, where you see someone writing on a desk, 
and they've got the little bottle of ink in the corner and they'll just dip their pen in the ink and keep writing. That's an inkwell. Okay, so why would Sartre say that we want to be an inkwell? Like no one wants to be an inkwell, that would be boring. But he, we wanna be like that. We wanna be the way that an inkwell is. An inkwell doesn't do anything, it just sits there and it has a clear purpose, it has a clear function. Okay, and it can't help but be what it is. It just sits there and all it has to do is lay on a desk and be full of ink and it works, it fulfills its purpose, it fulfills its function. We wanna be like that. We wanna have a clear purpose, we wanna have a clear function, uh, and also we wanna be responsible for it at the same time, to be proud of it, but at the same time, we don't. We, we, we're sort of in, as Sartre puts it, we're in, um, we're in bad faith, okay? Bad faith is something that, you know, he doesn't mention in the reading uh, by name, he doesn't call it bad faith, but he's, condemning it. It's being inauthentic. It's basically playing a role, playing a part, uh, and not being honest about the part that one is playing and acting like, you know, as if this is my true self, um, trying to be a thing. So we often do, you know, like the peeping Tom, you know, he might make excuses. What would he say? Like, what kind of stuff would a peeping Tom say, perhaps, if he got caught, you know? He might deny it or something like that, but, uh, what kind of things do we do when we when we when we we feel shame? How do we defend ourselves against the critics? You know, or how, maybe not yourself, but other people. You don't have to like fess up to what you do, but uh, you know, if somebody calls you out on something you didn't you they, that you did that wasn't so great. What what I know y'all are all saints, right? Y'all never do anything wrong. Is that is that is that what the deal is? I never feel shame because I'm perfect and I I'm impeccable and I never never mess up. Come on, well, what's that? Example with your hand in the cookie jar, you're going to say, oh, I was I was cleaning the cookie jar. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. There, you go. <laughs> there was a roach in the cookie jar, and I was Good. picking the roach out of the cookie jar or something like Great. that. Great. Good. I love. I like that example. Okay, that example, I'm, I'm going to steal that from you, by the way. I'm going to use oh, that. Go ahead. that, that that's, the, right. that's, a, that's a better one than the one I use usually use. But in that case, uh, what, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say, say yeah. you deflect. Say, oh, I right. would never put my hand in a cookie jar if you just gave, if you uh, just gave me a san uh, chicken sandwich or whatever, right, right. like I asked like 20 <laughs> minutes ago. That's a similar move. That's a similar move. In both those cases, um, I guess in the first case, you're calling the other person out on misinterpreting the situation. You're like, I was just cleaning. I was just cleaning the cookie jar. I mean, I guess the peeping Tom could be like, oh, I wasn't spying on her. Um, I was concerned. She looked like she was being pursued by someone uh, who looked very evil. And I thought uh, I was just trying to save her, you know, or something like this. So, and then you're saying, well, it's your fault. You should have given me that chicken sandwich earlier, right? Um, and in each case, Sartre would say, you're kind of making the other person into an in itself. You're, you're, you're mind reading. Oh, I know where you're, what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking and you're wrong. Well, do you ever know what someone's thinking? Can you ever see the, yourself the way the other person sees you? No, right? So, but yeah, Des, as Destiny puts it, you get defensive. And so you'll often deflect and you'll usually by deflection, you make the other person into an object. You sort of objectify them. And in a sense, they are an object. You see them, you see their body, you see how tall they are, you see what color t-shirt they're wearing. Yeah, they're an object, but that's not the part of them that's bothering you. It's the part of them that's not an object. The part inside them, the for itself, which can never be an object. You can never see their thoughts. That's what's getting you. You're like, what are they thinking about me? What are they thinking? About? They think I'm stealing. I'm not stealing. Uh, you're the one that didn't give me the chicken sandwich earlier. Otherwise, I wouldn't need the, the uh, 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 cookie. Uh, the Peeping Tom uh, example, though, or maybe the cookie example, that's probably a more innocent example, the cookie jar example. Um, another thing we might do is instead of deflecting, instead of calling out that other person and saying they don't get it, kind of treating them as an object, like, I know you and this is what you mean and you're wrong. You misinterpreted it. Um, the other thing we might do is we might, we might fess up. We might say, hey, man, you're right, dude, I did it. I got the hands in the cookie jar, but I have a cookie addiction. I just can't help myself. I have no control. Like I, I, I'm helpless. I'm helpless. I just cookies. Ah, I can't have a cookie monster. 
You know, like that, then you, you're, you're denying you have responsibility. You're denying, I guess the peeping Tom could say, oh, I, uh, I, I know it's wrong, but I'm a sex addict. I can't help, you know, what, whatever. I, I'm trying to get help. I'm trying to go to the doctor to get fixed, but I'm, it's, it's not my fault. I just have a problem. Like I have a chemical imbalance or, you know, this, this, whatever. So it, both of those are bad faith for SART, right? You're, you're miscategorizing. You're either, you know, when you get defensive and you deflect, you're, you're making the other into a, a lowercase o other. Oh, you're just the thing that doesn't get me. Nah, dude, they're a subjectivity who's judging your ass and they might actually totally get you and see right through your bullshit. And that's why you're getting defensive. You wouldn't get defensive if that weren't the case. And then, or you might just make excuses for yourself. Like, man, you got me, you're right. I've got my hands in the cookie jar, but man, I'm addicted to cookies. I got to get help, right? Got to go to Cookies Anonymous or whatever, do a 12 step program. Um, so yeah, those are the typical responses, Sartre's going to say. And he says they're both bullshit, right? They're, you, you've got to take stock of your, you know, take responsibility for your actions. But, you know, when we get to the reading here, right, we get to the existentialism is a humanism, you know, the main critique of him is like, okay, well, if this is all true, Sartre, and we're just free to interpret things as we like, and, you know, nothing has meaning in itself, all meaning and value comes from our engagement with the world, well, then why do we even care about anything? You know, this leads to a sort of uh, unethical or at least amoral philosophy uh, and there's no basis for any values and so Sartre has to defend these critics these are I guess ethical criticisms is that uh, Sartre's doctrine is bereft it's empty of ethics there's no ethics involved uh, I live my life by how I see fit if I decide to be a philanthropist and help people for a living or whether I decide to be a serial killer it's just up to me I do whatever I want uh, and there's no values that are, as Sartre puts it, there's no a priori uh, set in stone values. Uh, those are some pretty weighty criticisms. And so you know, can he can he answer those? If he can't, uh, you know, right after World War II, right after all the devastation of Europe, millions of people slaughtered, genocide, uh, you know, some of the darkest moments in our history, and you're telling me that there's no value to be found in this universe? We're hopeless then, Sartre. So uh, I guess it's, it's time for Sartre to get defensive, or at least he's got to be defensive of his doctrine. Um, and he starts off the essay, and now we're finally to the reading, with, um, you know, a reflection on the critics, sort of the main criticisms of existentialism. And then he jumps right into defining the doctrine itself. You know, what does existentialism mean? Uh, you know, what would I say? And I think we can probably get through most of this today. Uh, we, we might have to leave some of it for... Thursday, but um, there's three. There are three key terms uh, that he he covers. I wish he would have gone over the look. I think if he would have spent a little time on the look of the other and that psychology of that, he would have had a stronger argument. But for some reason, he he picked, he picked what he picked, and he picked these main ideas from his earlier book and decided to explain them. The first one is this idea that existence precedes essence, and then these three emotions: anguish forlornness oh you know what it's actually abandonment isn't it that's i this translation i like but it's a little different than the one i'm used to uh so let me see if i can spell abandonment abandonment okay it's usually forlornness so i might actually because i'm in the habit of lecturing on sart <laughs> with a different translation forlorn Forlornness. I might say the word forlornness and just to keep in your mind that those are synonymous. Abandonment, forlornness, that's the same thing. And then last but not least, despair. I think we can probably get through at least two or three of these before the end of the, the lecture today. So we'll see how far we get. But let's look at the critics first. So these are the critics, right? Um, like maybe I should put like a box around this or highlight it so it's pretty clear that uh, this is different from what's below. Okay, so what do the communists say? What do the Catholics say? Let's let's actually just do. Let's just go to the reading because uh, this is basically right where he starts. I think it's on page seventeen. Yeah, seven, page seventeen. So he says, 
All right. He says, first, my purpose here is to defend existentialism against charges that have been brought against it. First, because okay, so this is the first uh, charge, and this is the communist charge. First, existentialism has been blamed for encouraging people to remain in a state of quietism and despair. For if all solutions are barred, right, there's no absolute solution, there's no right answer, then we have to regard any action in this world as futile. And so at last we arrive at a contemplative philosophy. And inasmuch as contemplation is a luxury, we are only espousing yet another kind of bourgeois philosophy. These are the main reproaches made by the communists. So what, what exactly are the communists saying here? What's wrong with Sartre's doctrine of existentialism? It, it encourages people to remain in a state of quietism and despair. What does that mean, do you think? What is quietism? I mean, even if you've never heard the word, you might be able to take a pretty good guess. Quietism? What do you think? Uh, I believe it's a state of silence. Right. And I think this is with regard to anything, okay? Sartre is, um, he eventually, I don't know if it's ironic or whatever, be, but he eventually becomes a communist, right? He eventually becomes, well, he becomes a Marxist. I don't know if it's technically correct to call him a, a, a communist. I think socialist would be more accurate, but he was, he considers himself a Marxist philosopher in the, by the end of his career. But at this point in his career, he's, he's, I guess, basically anarchist on the fence between anarchism and socialism. And, um, you know, he's, so he's, he's, he's been accused of this. He wrote a play about a character probably based on himself who keeps getting bullied by all these different political factions in France. You need to join the communist. You need to join the socialist. You need to join this or that, the French party, the labor movement, this or that. He's like, all of you guys are too dogmatic. You're too, you know, one size fits all. And they say, oh, see, you existentialists can never make up your mind because there's no right answer. You're overwhelmed by choice. And so this leads to this sort of despair. What do I even, what, not, what matters? There's too many choices. Uh, why choose anything? Uh, and so that's sort of the idea uh, that is being espoused by the communist. And they also say that it's a, uh, it's a, uh, that, that, that it leads to a, a life of just contemplation, just sitting there and contemplate. It's a contemplative, not an active philosophy. And therefore, it's a bourgeois philosophy because contemplation is for those that have the luxury to contemplate. Uh, so it's a it's a bourgeois, which is like a total insult from a Marxist. You know, you don't want to be a bourgeois. You want to be proletarian, right? What's a what's bourgeois? What does that mean? What's come on, guys? Bougie. Uh, what's what was what, what's bougie? What's that mean? It's being up uppity high. High class, very yeah, I guess fancy up, to the point of being being yeah. snobbish. Yes, yes, right, yeah. I mean, in, in Marxist language, it's basically the upper class. Yeah, uh, you've got you've got you've got the proletariat. They're the working class. You've got like the shopper owners, the merchants, the managerial people. Those are the bourgeois. Okay, and then there's the capitalists. Those are the guys that actually run everything. The very, very few, like the like the ultra, super duper wealthy, like Be Jeff Bezos types. But pretty much everybody else is bourgeois or proletariat. You're either like some working class, you make all the stuff, or you're just like you said, sort of like well to do, like oh, I'm fancy. I I only fly oh. first class. Who's got their mic open? Somebody trying to say something? I think somebody's trying to jump in. I guess not. Okay. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so the, the communists are saying basically, and maybe this is a fair point, you know, because Sartre was pretty upper class. The guy, you know, he was born in, in the French upper class. He, he, you know, he was, his, his father died when he was really young, but he was raised by Albert Schweitzer, who was like this Nobel Prize winner and uh, went to all the finest schools and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So the communists are probably like, look, man, it's easy for you to talk about freedom. And, you know, I can just, just engage in any project I want. Uh, you know, Sartre once wrote that, um, um, that 
you and I sitting here engaging in discussion are just as free, no more, no less, than someone who's on the way to be executed, on the way to be executed at the scaffold. And you're like, what? He's like, well, the person who's being executed can, can't do as much with their freedom, but they're just as free. In, in, in other words, they're able to interpret the situation however they see fit. They can walk to the scaffold with their head held high, proud, you know, I'm dying for the right cause, viva la France or whatever, you know, or they can hang their head in shame, how dare, why'd I do this, you know? you know? It's up to them to interpret the situation how they see fit. Uh, and the communists are like, oh yeah, it's easy for you to say that. If you're Marxist, communist, you tend to see things as kind of set in stone, that your identity, your ideology, the way you see the world, you're going to see it that way based on your class. You know, you can't help but see the world a certain way because you're just raised this way. You know, you're inevitably going to believe that because you're biased. You're, you've got this bourgeois mentality and everything's sort of determined. Uh, and also for the, the, the um, communists, you know, they're basing most of their theories on Marxist philosophy. And they have this interpretation of Marx that, hey, we're guaranteed to be right. You know, we might not get what we want right now if we fight and die for the revolution. We might not enjoy it, but we know we're on the right side of history. And it's not, a, it's not an if, it's just when. We know that it's, it's you know, historically inevitable, uh, the Marxist will say. It's historically inevitable capitalism will fail. And then capitalism will give, a, give rise to socialism, and then socialism will dissolve, and eventually we'll have this communist utopia with no class structure, no, no haves and have-nots, no property, one big happy family, uh, and we'll all, you know, hold hands and sing kumbaya. And this is guaranteed, right? There's no, like, it's just, you know, so if you die fighting for communism, you know you're you're fighting for the right cause. And Sartre is gonna say, no, you don't. You never know if you're fighting for the right cause. You can never know for sure anything is gonna be successful. Uh, the, the future is not set in stone. And the communists are like, well, that leads to this despair. Why even do anything if nothing is, is certain, if nothing is guaranteed, uh, why choose anything? Okay, so what about, what about the Catholics? What do they have to say? Uh, he says, others have condemned us for emphasizing what is despicable about humanity, for exposing all that is sordid, suspicious, or base, while ignoring beauty and the brighter side of human nature. For example, according to uh, Miss Mossier, a Catholic critic, we have forgotten the innocence of a child's smile. So I guess the idea is that because existentialism doesn't have these a priori transcendental values, uh, it doesn't talk about, you know, it doesn't see the beauty in the world. It just sees all the, the darkness. And I honestly think that's just sort of an a, a unfair characterization and probably partly Sartre's fault because he uses such salty, uh, dark examples to get to make his point. Uh, I think he's more of a realist, though, than, than, than just, you know, he's not saying there aren't good things in the world, but those good things are things that we have to uh, sort of engage in, and, and they're only good because we make them so. They're not just sitting there waiting to be uh, sort of handed to us. They have to be earned through our actions and our activities and through our convictions uh, and this sort of thing. The Catholic says, no, if there's no God or no higher power, you know, then there's no sort of, you know, we forget about the innocence of the child. We just think about the dark and, and hopelessness of, 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 the, of the world. And, and, and so this sort of leads to this, uh, uh, this doctrine with no standards, right? That, I think that to me, that's the, the biggest and the most relevant criticism uh, against Sartre, which I think the Catholics are right to point out, is that, you know, well, how do you, how do you have a standard for judgment? Uh, you know, let's see, uh, the next paragraph, he, well, he kind of recaps. He says, one group censors us for overlooking humanity's solidarity, that's the communist, and for co considering man as an isolated being. Uh, this contending communist is primarily because we think our doctrine on pure subjectivity, that is the Cartesian, I think, on the very moment when man fully co comprehends his isolation, rendering us incapable of establishing solidarity with those who exist outside of the self. So that's the communist. But the Christians, on the other hand, especially the Catholics, they reproach us for denying the reality and validity of the human enterprise. For inasmuch as we choose to ignore God's commandments and all values thought to be eternal, all that remains is the strictly gratuitous. 
everyone can do whatever he pleases and isn't capable from his small vantage point of finding fault with the points of view or actions of others. So, you know, if we're free to decide what we like and what we value, and we're completely isolated in our own self to do that, um, how can we ever judge anybody else for their choices? Sartre doesn't seem to give us any sort of leeway in this regard. And so he's got to explain how, you know, existentialism is a humanism. Besides the fact that it's completely individualistic, it still establishes a camaraderie with our fellow men. Uh, and just as, and despite the fact that it doesn't provide us with a priori values that we all have to adhere to, uh, it does assert that all values are human. And so it's humanistic. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later because he doesn't really address the humanism part, what he means by humanism, till towards the end of the article. But that's basically his goal here, is to show that the Catholics and the communists are wrong. Um, so I don't know, how would I sum up the Catholics, right? No standard of judgment. It's pessimistic. I guess that's another thing. It's, it forgets the innocence of the child of the child's smile, the innocence of the child's smile. Pessimistic. Okay. So how is Sartre going to respond to the critics? We'll see some of that today, but we'll probably have to wait for his response, the meat of it, most of it, the, the essential parts, uh, till Thursday, till next meeting. Uh, but let's lay down the doctrine itself, okay? So he claims that what he means by existentialism is the belief that existence precedes essence. So existent, and, and he's only talking about human existence, not all existence, but just our existence. Our existence, human existence, precedes essence. What do you, what do you, what do you think he means by that? How far did you, somebody, somebody get that far in the reading? I hope so, because it's not that far. It's only a few pages in. Uh, what do you think he means to say that existence precedes essence? How would you try to explain that to somebody else? You know, who's maybe someone who's not taking this class or something. Existence precedes essence. Yeah, I read it, but it's like the, the concept still eludes me. <laughs> well, let me let me read the. Uh, there's a passage on page 20 where he talks about um, how, like, he uses the example of a paper knife and a book, and he says that for those objects, the reverse is true, right? Their essence precedes their existence. We're the only beings, the for itself, the being for itself. We're the only kind of beings for which this is true, for which our existence precedes. So let's look what he says about the paper cutter, and then maybe it'll become a little bit more clear. So bottom of page 20, um, he says, if we consider a manufactured object, such as a book or a paper knife, a paper knife, paper cutter, whatever, um, we note that this object was produced by a craftsman, and he drew his inspiration from a concept. He referred both to the concept of what a paper knife is and to a known production technique that is part of the concept and that is by and large a formula. The paper knife is thus both an object produced in a certain way and one that on the other hand serves a definite purpose. We cannot suppose that a man would produce a paper knife without knowing what purpose it would serve. Let us say, therefore, that the essence of the paper knife, and here he gives us kind of his rough definition of what does he mean by essence. He says, you know, let's say for, that for the, that the essence of the paper knife, that is the sum of formulae and the properties that enable it to be both produced and defined precedes its existence. Thus the presence before my eyes of the paper knife or book is determined. Here then, we're, we're view, we are viewing the world from a technical standpoint, point, whereby we can say that production precedes essence. So, so no, actually, that's a, that's a mistranslation. It should be production precedes existence. I, I, that's the first time I've ever uh, noticed that. So, um, Pat, who translated this? That was a bad translation. I've got the French back behind me to back it up. But anyway, uh, but I think the main point is still is still clear, right? That this object here, right, this pen, B 
before it ever existed, there was a plan in place. Okay. Engineers got together, lawyers, right? There's like a, 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 a somebody designed the logo. Lawyers copyrighted the logo and trademarked it. Engineers got together, figured out how to make a, you know, the, the machinery, uh, design the factory that would produce these things, you know, industrial engineering. And you had marketers that marketed it. You know, before this thing ever was even a thing, and before it even existed, it already, we already knew why we were making it. We made it so that I could grade papers with it. We're not like that, says Sartre. We don't exist the way that this pen exists. If we did, there would have to be another factor involved, right? If we were like a pen or this bottle of water, if, if our essence, what defined us, what gave us our purpose, our meaning, if that came before our existence, what would that have to involve according to Sartre? Or maybe you might just guess, even if you didn't read, do the reading or, or if you didn't even understand the reading. If, if we're like this pen, what has to, there has to be another factor, right? This pen didn't just create itself. Some people created it. Like a whole business got together. They want to make money selling school supplies, whatever, office supplies. If we're like this, what would that have to involve? What would, what would be planning all this stuff? If our essence came first, where would our essence come from? God. Yeah. I mean, that's what, uh, that's what, that's what Sartre says. Now, I, I, I was just thinking about this. Maybe if you're like Aristotle, you might say, well, you could just get it from nature. But then where does nature come from? And Aristotle will say, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. Nature comes from God. So, hey. All right. Well, I, well, I don't know. It's, I don't know. What I just said is a very oh, – uh, Aristotle scholars might give me shit for what I just said. So take it with a grain of salt. Okay. But, uh, but he's a, a – start saying, look, if, if we are like this pen uh, where before we were ever born – we had there was like a plan in place we were defined there was a purpose right like Ita, you know before you were ever born Ita, like god said i've got to create this person and he has to take philosophy at tsu in fall of 2020 and he's got you know everything you've ever done in your whole life was already planned even though it seems like you chose these things and you marked a path for yourself no 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 you're fulfilling your purpose god made you for this certain purpose and you're fulfilling it it's already set in stone okay and so for Sartre, you know, because he's an atheistic existentialist, he's going to say, well, there is no God. And so there's at least one object in the universe that exists before it can be defined. And that's us. And this is what I think kind of makes his, his, his argument kind of weak. And he's really, if you're careful at reading this, I don't think he's that consistent about this. Um, but I don't think it really matters whether or not you're an atheist. I still think he's kind of correct about this because let's just say you do have a purpose and, you know, God did have, you know, this purpose in mind for you when you were created. How would you ever know that? Like you're not born with an instruction manual. Um, and so this whole idea that you have to be an atheist to sort of acknowledge the fact that, well, you know, whether or not I have an essence, that is something that I'm going to have to sort of figure out. And I don't, you know, he's going to say, I don't really have any way of knowing it. He, he, he kind of corrects himself on this a little bit later. You know, we'll talk about this when we get to forlornness and abandonment. Uh, he, he says, well, you know, ultimately, even though I am an atheist, Sartre says, he says, it doesn't really matter. Even if there is a God, all these things are true about our condition. We are in this condition of, you know, not really knowing why we're here. You know, we're here, but we don't know why. Uh, this object, it's here, and I know why it's here. It's here so I can use it to grade papers with, to make notes in red ink. Uh, that's why it's here. But can I define myself that way? I can, but I, am, am I right? How will I ever know? And for Sartre, this is something that um, is hard for us to accept. We like to have easy answers to problems. And this problem of existence is maybe perhaps the deepest problem there ever is or was in our life. Why are we here? What is my purpose? Why am I, what am I going to make of myself? And so we don't like facing up to this, Sartre says in general. We typically try to ignore these questions and we try to find rough and ready answers, easy answers that are already sort of there 
uh, uh, waiting for us. You know, just do what your parents tell you. Do what society says is correct. Uh, but for Sartre, there's really no way to know if, if any of those are the right way. Um, you know, we, we, we can't really define ourselves in, in, in such a sense. Let me find, there's, there's a famous, this is probably the most, most famous passage um, that Sartre ever wrote. It's, it's probably his most widely quoted. Uh, and this is where he tries to kind of summarize what he means when he says this, when he says that existence uh, precedes essence. And this is on page 22. Oh, it's about a third of the way down. Uh, he, he says, what do we mean here by existence precedes essence? We mean that man first exists. He materializes in the world, encounters himself, and only afterwards defines himself. If man, as existentialists conceive of him, cannot be defined, it is because, to begin with, he is nothing. He will not be anything until later, and then he will be what he makes of himself. Thus, there is no human nature, since there's no God to conceive of it. Man is not only that which he conceives himself to be, but that which he wills himself to be. And since he conceives of himself only after he exists, just as he wills himself to be after being thrown into existence, man is nothing other than what he makes of himself. And so this also doesn't, I, I think this is also, not only does, does he explain this phrase existence precedes essence, but we also get to kind of the gist of, of his, his, I guess what it, the sort of argument he's trying to drive home here um, is that um, you're really nothing if you don't do anything. Uh, and so um, this claim by the communists that uh, existentialism leads to quietism and doing nothing is completely unfounded for Sartre because again for him if you don't do you know when you begin with you're not you're not born brave or 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 a coward those are things you become and you manifest in your actions and so you know for him you know he's going to keep reiterating this point i don't think he ever uses this phrase but he basically you know, he's one of these actions speak louder than words kind of guys you can say I value this, I care about that. But those are just words. What you really value is pretty much apparent, he's gonna say, in what you, how you act and what you stand up for, what you fight for, what you ignore, what you let pass, what you don't let pass. And, um, and that's really on you, for sorry. You're absolutely responsible. And this absolute responsibility for him, it's, it's, it's a lot more far reaching than you might suppose at first. I mean, you might be with him on this whole, like, yeah, we are responsible for our actions. I like this, you know? Too many people make excuses for themselves. I like what Sard is saying. You know, you might be thinking that in your head. Um, but he's not just saying that you're responsible for yourself. You're responsible for all mankind, as he puts it. You know, he says that, you know, you are responsible, for, you know, he once wrote in, I think it's in Being in Nothingness, he says that you're, you're guilty of the war. If you're not fighting the war or fighting against the war, you're complicit in it. So you can say like, I, I oppose the war. I'm not for it. I, I think we should bring the troops home. It's unjust. Well, for Sartre, that's just words, right? Uh, if you're not actively engaged and using all your resources to try to fight it, well, then you obviously you don't care that much about it. You obviously don't, you know, there's other things that are more important to you. Uh, and so for Sartre, that's what it's all about. And he's going to say that because of this responsibility, right? When I make choices, they're not just my choices. They're choices that are going to affect everybody else. When I decide that I'm going to join the army and be a soldier, that's going to affect all the people in my lives. And when I go to fight in the battlefield, that might affect people that aren't even in my life. People I don't even know, strangers, people from other countries and things like this. So all my actions are going to sort of run up against other freedoms. When I do this, that means I'm responsible. And not just for myself, but for the ramifications of, of my being and what I do with myself. And this is something we don't want to accept. This is a hard pill to swallow, he says, but it's true. And it, it's the only thing he's going to say that explains our feelings of anguish, our feelings of abandonment, and our feelings of despair. It's only through this deep responsibility, this absolute freedom and responsibility, the burden is on our shoulders, right? We're absolutely responsible for 
deciding what we care about, how we're going to live our lives, but we're completely alone on this and responsible for it. That, that responsibility is, 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 it's a heavy weight. It's liberating, you know, gives us this freedom, but it's heavy. And that's why we feel this anguish, this abandonment, this despair. And um, we'll talk about what he means by these terms next class, because we're getting pretty close to the end of the meeting right now. And I, I don't think you'll be helped by covering more material. I think we've already covered enough SART today. Uh, and this is a good start. This is, this is a nice place to stop too. So I think uh, we'll pick up at the beginning of class next time. Maybe we'll do a quick recap on existence preceding essence and what that means and how, how that ties into anguish, abandonment and despair. And what does SART mean by these terms? Because they're, they're common words. You hear people, I'm in anguish, I'm despairing. Uh, but SART has a very specific uh, meaning, what, what he's talking about, the phenomenon and how we experience these things. So uh, that's what we have to look forward to next time. So at least get that far in the reading, at least get through the section on anguish, abandonment, and despair. We'll probably get past that though. So, I mean, if I were you, I'd get through as much of it as possible. Um, I'm thinking Sartre will probably be, uh, we'll probably be covering him all this week and all of next week. And then after that, we'll uh, move on uh, to Nietzsche. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and I'll stick around for just, I guess, a minute or two in case anybody wants to ask any questions about the class or any other just sort of personal things. Uh, besides that, I guess, yeah, class dismissed. Y'all are free to go and I will um, see you all again on Thursday. So have a good day.